Hello everybody. I hope that the other two who I would like to welcome for this forum are on. That's Wolfgang Kalek from Berlin and Rodrigo Mundaco from Valparaiso. Wolfgang is the founder of the European Center for Constitutional Human Rights and its legal director. At the moment he's publishing a book specific Utopian Views of Human Rights, which is directly related to our forum. Rodrigo Mundaca from Valparaiso is the national spokesman of his movement for access to clean water and environmental protection, and he's also running for election. My name is Thomas Seiber. I work for Medica International. I'm from Frankfurt. First of all, some housekeeping information. Once again, you can use the chat function, which is important because everybody who wants to can participate via the chat and the translation channels are available. So you can choose your language if you click on the globe symbol. There's one more special thing, as we've discussed so much, and that's inevitable. After the three presentations, we are going to start with the questions from the chat function immediately. So, Anita, as soon as the, as the three of us have finished, we'll take the first questions from the chat function, and our answers will then be our final remarks. And this forum will link up to the previous function directly, and it links up to the same problem, which was discussed in the previous forum, that is the problem of revolution and of the circumstance that the revolution itself can get into phases of crisis. Saitan Vadal said quite clearly, the end of revolution, when this comes, is decided by the revolutionaries, and it's up to the revolutionaries. So, the duration of the revolution is not a matter of its end, but of its interruptions or abortions. And this is what we see again and again, and this is what we would like to discuss in more detail here. And we'll use two terms here, which are in the title of this forum, human rights, production, and program. And the term of human rights, this comes from more recent critical theory, and it has always also been formed by medical in its program. And this term responds to the most important questions related to revolution. The question for the revolution's duration and the question for its subjects. The duration of a revolution, many revolutionaries tended to agree about this. It takes much longer than the moment it's often reduced to. It takes much longer than, for example, the storming of the Winter Palace, or what is closer to us, longer than the Free Assembly on Tahrir Square in Cairo. A real revolution, this has been the broad consensus, needs to be a permanent one, a revolution intended for duration. So the problem with this uh, intention is that a permanent revolution may be plagued by interruptions and be aborted. And this is why many tend to fall for this error of reducing the revolution for the storm to the storm of the Winter Palace. Calling the permanent revolution a human rights revolution means that the permanent revolution began with the Declaration of Human Rights in 1789 with the French Revolution. And a few years later, it met with its practical globalization with the Haitian Revolution. We call it a human rights revolution because its intermediate results, which are condensed in major events, were put into writing in human rights in a legal and political form. And this becomes visible from the different human rights which we have assigned to ourselves historically. So the political human rights come from the American, the French, and the Haitian revolutions. This is where they were 
put into writing first and the Declaration of the Economic, Social and Cultural Human Rights would be unthinkable without the October Revolution. The so-called collective human rights owe their existence mainly to the many anti-colonial revolutions of the global south. The extremely precarious status shows that this epoch of permanent revolution is not yet completed, but it's only interrupted. At present, among the many continuing struggles, there are special struggles which are also fought directly related to human right, but this time it's not about a new type of human right, but it's rather for enforcing their application also in the production and supply chains of global capitalism. And Medico is involved with its program in many of these human rights struggles. But there are not only differences among the human rights in their character as first political rights, secondly economic, social and cultural rights, and thirdly as collective human rights. They are also distinguished whether they are used in singular or in plural, whether we speak of them in singular or in plural. The singular human right, this is a uh, used in the text of the German Socialist International, in the German text. And here it's used synonymous with uh, human dignity. This term is used in practically all societies and cultures and has always been put in a special content. For example, we can say that the term of human dignity in a Christian context is based on the nature of humans as children of God. So being children of God was the reason in the Christian religion that humans have a special and unique dignity. The modern term of human right does not have this one uh, content in which it is put, but it is instead based on the human capability which is inherent in the individual's and social existence to choose freely the content of their existence so that their own existence along with others is determined by themselves in their own responsibility. The singular human right becomes a program that is, it is a binding declaration for all of us. Program, in fact, comes from Greek programma and means exactly this, a binding public declaration. With its public declaration, the human right in singular, the right for self-determination, is immediately then diversified in its plural of human rights. There is an open list, open for the whole duration of the permanent human rights revolution, which serves as a, pro a program that is a binding public declaration of what is given in political, economic, social, cultural and collective terms and needs to be guaranteed for all of us so that our human right, the singular, can in fact be lived both in the individual and in the social context. Article 28 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights brings together the singular of human right and the plural of human rights by stating, let me quote, Everyone is entitled to social and international order in which the rights and freedoms set forth in this declaration can be fully realized. What is realized today is neither human right in singular, nor the many human rights, nor the international and social order in which they will be 
realized completely and this is why the human rights revolution is a permanent revolution and it's subject to all the individuals both in the singular and in the plural who are fighting for the full realization of human rights. Wolfgang Kallek and Rodrigo Mondaka, two human rights activists, so this also means human rights revolutionaries, are now going to explain how this revolutionary struggle can be fought today and must be fought today, taking these periods of interruption of revolutionary struggle into their side. So they will speak about movements like the Ch Chilean mass movement of the last few years, but they will also look at the perspective of the individual who see themselves as human rights activists. So now I've finished and I'd immediately like to hand over to Rodrigo. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. I would like to welcome everyone most warmly. If I've understood correctly, I have 15 minutes and I'll try not to take longer. This is your time after all as well. I would speak I would like to speak about uh, the remembering the past, about those who in the 70s and 80s were looking for a new solution in Chile and who also had to apply violence, substantive violence, in order to uh, face up to a dictatorship. And what I will say will be said against the backdrop of history, and history is key in order to an be able to analyze the present and to predict the future. History is dialectic. It's a dialectic that describes how society, a nature, and thoughts are formed. And it is on this basis that I would also like to dedicate what I will say to the many who have lost their lives in the context of uh, the uprisings in Chile, the many, many people who were injured because they were attacked by the police, and thousands of injured people, of people who were arrested, and many public movements that were persecuted by the police. And it is the socio-ecological development and movement in Chile that was trying to put an end to injustice. We would like to emphasize that simple elements such as water and nature should be uh, available to all. In the 70s and in the 80s, 18 Latin American countries experienced a dictatorship. Chile was no exception to that. The first seven years of the uh, dictatorship regime, uh, Pinochet, was very strict. From 73 through 80, people were brutally persecuted. Social institutions were destroyed. Other ideologies were not tolerated. And beginning in the 80s, terrible cruelty followed from the hands of the dictatorship. And then starting in the 80s on the basis of political movements, the system of exploitation was installed. And to this day, it is here to stay. We're talking about 40 years of exploitation in Chile, which started in the 80s. That was the beginning of neoliberalism in Latin America. It is said that Chile was the cradle of neoliberalism. We were the model pupil. It was in our country that capitalism was um, taken to its extremes, and the constitution of the 
80s was such that the state was described as a subsidiary state, that is something that could intervene in those activities and mark parts of the market where the private sector or private entities were active. It was a constitution that gave us the freedom to choose, to choose an education, to freely choose between private and public health care providers, amongst other things. This constitution, which we have now had for 40 years, also governed the distribution of water in Chile and how it was made available to people. So it is the constitution that dates back to the 80s, which pretty much privatized the distribution of water. And this constitution, which was developed um, as part of a dictatorship that has held a firm grip on our society at the same time represents the pillars of exploitation in our society, the pillars of injustice. In 1990, the dictatorship found its end, not by means of a revolution. It was a, an end that was negotiated, but still the dictator governed um, the army, certain senators still were handpicked personally, in other words, not by means of a public election. And in the 90s, the so-called professional politicians told the members of society that everything will be better, that they would take care of the country. And it was in the 90s that David Harvey, a British geographer, said <coughs> or talked about an accumulation on the basis of taking away the rights of others at a social level, at the level of education, in health care, in the distribution of food. So a deprivation of rights that also applied to important factors such as water and land. And it became more and more pronounced every year. Politicians gave promises that they never kept. They took away people's rights to education, to access to water, pensions. Most pension systems in Chile uh, were privatized. There are private pension funds which which benefit, which profit, rather than benefiting the workers. The savings of workers are invested in the capital markets, generating major profits for the private pension funds. At the same time, most workers in Chile have to uh, live of pensions that are less than uh, the limit of poverty. Starting in the 90s, actually starting as early as in 1986, when uh, the dictatorship uh, began to disappear, there was a different election system that continued from the 90s through to 2017. And that was a system that was based on consensus. Uh, negotiations took place between uh, government and opposition. However, minority groups had no chance of making any changes to the system. It was a system that consisted of two major blocks that shared the power from 1990 until today. We have found that um, it was always two parts of a coalition that uh, that um, negotiated and settled things between each other. Sometimes the majority was on one side, sometimes on the other. But you could say we had a social democratic um, regime with Edwin, Edwin as a president. Then uh, the next uh, head of government came about, then Bachelet, Pineda, and all of them time and again gave more promises. Bachelet again 
and ultimately the government now headed by Piñera. So since the 90s, it was on the basis of our electoral process and our legislation, which does, is not representative of minorities, which uh, is based on an established political class. We've been g governed by regimes that have further intensified this system of accumulation that I mentioned. Since 1990, time and again, there have been attempts at social movements, which, however, uh, were drowned out. It was like a gas burner, which was about to explode at any point in time. Did someone say something, the speaker says? Well, as I said, since the 90s, the country has uh, been transforming. It was like a pressure vessel of sorts, more and more social movements cropped up. The private pension funds saw a lot of criticism. People called on their right uh, to education and health access to health care, uh, access to natural resources, water specifically, but land as well. And this, this pressure vessel of sorts, which uh, was in place for a long time, also due to the great number of promises that were never kept, promises that were made by different parties in government, all of that ultimately ended on 18th October 2019. On 18th October of 2019, that it was a pretty normal day, a very normal day, but it was on the 18th of October 2019 that a movement, a massive movement movement of the populace was triggered, a movement that we had never before seen in Chile. And it was triggered because the fare prices for riding the metro, the subway, had been increased. That was uh, the tr thing that triggered everything. However, the movement or the formation of the movement wasn't necessarily something that occurred spontaneously, not uh, the way many people described it. It wasn't just 30 pesos that we are rebelling against. It is 30 years of injustice, it was said. 30 years of neoliberalism, of uh, disenfranchisement, of uh, the elite versus the people. And politicians are saying that they never saw it coming. They uh, would not have thought that such a an uprising could form. And Pineda's uh, regime actually even spoke about um, foreign interventions, externalization in connection with capitalism. Others uh, emphasized the rage felt uh, by the people and explained it by linking it to generational issues. Some people tied the left revol revolt to uh, criminal gangs or groups. But we, uh, those who study these movements of the people have concluded that it was just an amassing of dissatisfaction uh, for decades. It was a, a system that we ha had to experience that was marked by not listening to the population, bad pension system, not a good health care system, no access to public education. Families had to generate tremendous savings if they wanted to be able to send their children to university. So all the reasons stated by Pineda's regime uh, that, were, that were put forward to explain this revolt of the people were far-fetched. They spoke about the externalities of the modern capitalist system. They spoke of um, foreign intervention, but that's not true. This 
popular revolt, rather this uprising was proof of a people not willing to continue as before. They said it was enough. The system that started off in a dictatorship had not been changed and the political case had uh, been clinging to it and um, the most important representatives had been clinging to it and this popular uprising put an end to this. And it showed that if action would, were not to be taken now, the rich would continue getting ever richer and the working population would be left behind. And I believe these popular uprisings, and in this case, I'm not talking about um, a social upheaval, but this popular uprising is something that is systemic in nature. Uh, when analysts speak of social upheavals, what they are talking about is a phenomenon that forms spontaneously. What happened in Chile was not spontaneous at all. On the contrary, this popular uprising was a result of too much pressure, too much pressure that had been accumulated. Um, it was a political process. For too long a time, we had a system in place that had not seen change since the time of the dictatorship. And there have been many dictatorships in Latin America. But many Latin American dictatorships also ended with a change of the constitution. Not so in our case. We still have that con had that constitution. So what happened um, in the wake of this um, popular uprising um, on the 25th of October 2019, in the context of this popular revolt, the largest demonstration in the country took place in Santiago de Chile in the capital. More than 1.5 million people took to the streets. And they took to the streets everywhere in the country. It was more than 4 million people all in all. On the 12th of November 2019, there was a national standstill, a national strike. And 90% of people working in the productive system took part. And there is one special characteristic that I would like to emphasize in connection with this um, popular revolt. There were no leaders. It was quite a colorful mix. It was people, uh, workers from the rural regions, people from the cities, a great number of women. The women played, in fact, in a very important role in this popular uh, revolt. Uh, it wasn't party flags that were held up. There was, there was also a sense of being fed up with the political system. People rejected the political case, in fact. And on the 12th of November 2019, this major strike occurred, a major standstill. Things came to a halt. And the political caste then wanted to conclude an agreement for peace with the Pinera government. And they put forward a schedule on the 25th of October 2020. Uh, the population in Chile was asked to comment on the public constitution and how that constitution was to come about. And I believe uh, probably many people from, from and in Chile are listening right now. So this the, a constitutional agreement was concluded or, or drafted, but it did not really reflect what the population had called for. The indigenous people, for instance, did not see enough consideration. They were not taken into account so sufficiently, that is. A lot of basic elements uh, were not addressed. Plus, a mechanism of democratic participation was missing. And ever since, ever since this peace agreement, Discussions have continued regarding this plebiscite. This 
question that was directed at the people. And on the 25th of October 2020, where uh, the Chileans were asked whether they were in favor of, of or against a new constitution and what shape that con new constitution should take. And I believe we must not forget that uh, what, what has been happening since March of 2020 in Chile, that is ever since the pandemic, pandemic started, the pandemic pretty much strengthened Pineta and, and the Pineta regime, because un, up until that point, people had been taken to the streets, they kept insisting, a great number of people were arrested. However, with the beginning of the pandemic, uh, the Pineta regime could take a breather, as it were. Uh, the uh, human rights movement withdrew, we were under lockdown. Chile is severely f affected or was severely infected by the pandemic in Latin America. We were one of the h hardest hit countries in Latin America, many, many deaths, which also had to do with the fact just uh, how bad the management of uh, the Pineda government uh, in the case of the crisis uh, was. Just yesterday, the to topic of necropolitics was man mentioned, that is how specific interests on the part of governments actually put the lives of a population at risk. Either way, as a result of the pandemic, uh, the government could relax and take a breather. And now a constitutional program is being developed. The politicians have withdrawn. And on the 25th of October of 2020, that was the date uh, of the plebiscite. And the process that was started on that day showed that 80% of the Chilean population um, was in favor of a new constitution. Those were the results. However, what they also are calling for is a mechanism of constitutional change. And sorry? Uh, the speaker is just being informed that not a lot of time is left. I'll keep, I'll, I'll continue, says the speaker. So we all voted for or are in favor for a, of constitutional change and the 25 people who will be working on working out that constitution should be democratically elected. So it was th on this date, the 25th of October 2020, that a new path has been embarked upon. And on the 11th of April 2021, not only these 25 persons who are expected to draft the new constitution are to be elected, we also will have um, municipal elections in our country and quite a few things will change. And despite uh, the health crisis in the country currently, there is also a curfew that applies starting at 9 p.m. in the evening, which is also in line with the logic of control pursued by the Pineta regime. Uh, they said that there was um, health crisis uh, <clears throat> without going into further explanation, but uh, they're clinging to the pa to power. He continues to cling to power. There still are social movements in place. However, their repercussions are not as vast as they were before. So since 2019, uh, it's gotten a bit less. But um, there is an interesting uh, a controversy, a public debate regarding this issue of the Constitution. Everyone has understood that in order to overcome uh, disenfranchisement and to leave behind us this system of accumulation, a new um, legal system is required, a legal framework is required that will allow us to obtain and reobtain our rights. And it is important to now uphold this social momentum, this momentum both in the rural areas and in the urban context uh, to exert pressure on those who are supposed to bring about to create this legal framework. And it's important to keep focusing on our social rights that cannot be negotiated. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rodrigo. I think we can now immediately move on to Wolfgang. Thank you, Thomas, and thank you very much, Rodrigo. And I'd like to thank Medico very much for organizing this important event. And uh, what about this echo? Do, are you also getting this echo, or is this only on my side? 
kilometers. And he said, Do you also, are you also getting this echo? It's a slight echo. Just go on talking. OK. So first of all, I'd like to thank Medico for this event. And secondly, that we, as a junior co-organizer, the European Center for Constitutional Human Rights, are also involved. And as we have this role as a secondary co-organizer, I would like to mention one thing. It makes us extremely sad that with all these topics and with the many people interested, we can't meet physically. You can see this from the previous uh, podium. We simply miss the resonance in a physical meeting. It has become quite obvious. And what's also missing is the force and the dynamism that comes from an assembly of real body. That's very important because we've heard so much that especially at the moment, the pandemic and also the many crises have led to a disintegration of the social. And this is dangerous to our work. It's dangerous for a spirit of internationalism and for a spirit of global solidarity, which needs to be developed in the first place. We're on the way there. And this is why I insist on this so much. This is why we need real assemblies. We need to be visible in the public space. What has been quite successful so far is the debate on the world. And this, in fact, was planned for the this panel, the question how it can be improved and how it can be made habitable for all. And in this, I see the problem. And this is reflected in these two panels, that on the one hand, of course, there will be a lot of struggles and a lot of resistance against disenfranchisement, against authoritarian tendencies and inequality, and we need to link them up in some way. And what's interesting, Thomas, is you've introduced this category of human rights. And if I remember correctly, we have hardly heard of human rights before in the two and a half days of this conference. And that's something that also needs to be reflected. I find it exciting that you introduced this concept of the human rights revolution. I would also like to introduce a concept of a concrete utopian idea, because I see one or two problems with the term human rights revolution. The one thing is that many people still see the mere change in government or in rule when we speak of revolution. Whereas I think it's about removing all kinds of hierarchical uh, rule and risings and resistance. The many risings that have happened doesn't make a revolution. And I'm afraid when we're using, when we're only using the term revolution, this will bring about a delusion as if we were about to experience this. And the other thing is, Revolution is an abstract term. And what should we really do with this term tomorrow, on Monday morning, when we're all going back to our work, to our political work, to wherever we're committed? Now, as you've said, there is a more recent understanding of human rights. And I find it important to recap this, because this is also what I found important for this panel, Thomas. I mean, in the human rights discussion, we need to see the political, the social, and the legal dimension. And Rodrigo's contribution has just been an excellent example of this. So we need to remind ourselves that the Declaration of Human Rights, the Declaration of Human Rights of the French Revolution of 1789 and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948 were not the end point on certain developments. They didn't seal something that had been achieved. I mean, it says all people are born free and with equal rights. 
but uh, that's not always the reality. And this brings us to the link between law and politics. It has been written down that it has to be like this, that all people are equal and born free. And in fact, you said this and you also spoke about this with Susan Buck Morris and with your reference to Haiti. The Haitians took this literal. And they've created something which had been considered to be unthinkable before in history. And this is what we need to be working on to make other unthinkable stories possible. But this requires our commitment and commitment at many different levels. And I think these levels are well interconnected in this term of a concrete utopian idea. Because we can see a, a practical and pragmatic dimension and a legal dimension. And why this is coming in has been seen in nearly every panel of this conference. When I look at the various panels, right from the beginning, first we had a minute of science, silence in memory of Lockman Singh, who was murdered, and now we need to use a legal means for investigating this and making reference to human rights. For Haiti, we also need to think of a legal form for human rights, this incredible irresponsibility of international organizations, among others the UN. This needs to be overcome. And to, for example, hold accountable the UN for the cholera disaster and in Moria, in, in this refugee camp on Lesbos and in many other countries. Yeah, uh, let, it, it was pointed out there are these rights and they're anchored in various conventions, but they need to be mobilized. Even in Syria, with a revolution that was uh, killed off with incredible brutality, there are such processes now. Also, uh, artifacts that can were robbed can be requested back uh, again by re by invoking human rights. And for me, and uh, that's why I'm glad that I get to sit on the panel with Rodrigo, the Chilean and Ar Argentinian human rights movements have illustrated how this accumulation of disenfranchisement, as Rodrigo called it, can be undone. The accumulation of disenfranchisement to an extreme point to torture in the Pinochet camps and of the Argentinian military dictatorship, where step by step the human rights movement tried to um, enforce human dignity, although it was clear that it wouldn't, they wouldn't leave it at that. And um, in Chile now, we are seeing that on the basis of these movements, the call for a new constitution has formed. And it is clear that rights will be written into this constitution that have not been realized yet. They have to be realized as part of the political process. And in Argentina also, where the mothers of those who have disappeared have again reminded us we are all feminists, where the, uh, the, the younger feminist movement is playing a rule, role. It is clear that these different struggles are being linked to each other, the different struggles. And Thomas, you also spoke about um, the idea of a crisis. At which point in time do rights play a role in the human rights revolution? It doesn't necessarily have to be a crisis. But it is clear that in uh, moments uh, such as Guantanamo or Mor the Moria camp on Lesbos, uh, what it comes down to is what is existential, the enforcement of rights in uh, processes such as in Syria or Argentina or Chile, where um, systematic torture also has to be addressed. You start from a point of defense. You're in a defensive position, but from that defensive position, you have a starting point, um, and a response has been found to uh, 
the, the regime and it is possible to switch to the offensive and maybe that's also a reason why the topic of human rights so far hasn't played so much of a role earlier in the, the, in the panel we heard a lot about of the, about ambivalence a liberal world order universal human rights in the way they're promoted specifically by and in the west there much could be said about the ambivalent nature of human rights, specifically th about the way they are understood in the current um, discourse. And the Western governments, European governments, the US governments in the past 20, 30, 40 years have done whatever they could to discredit this human rights discourse because they used it for political for their political purposes but that isn't new that um, those in power take certain concepts certain terms and instrumentalize them we must not allow them to do that what we also must not allow and Thomas this may be the most important thing in connection with this uh, concept of the human rights revolution and the term this static way of thinking of human rights is something that we must no longer accept. Uh, human rights once fixed in place, in declarations, in law, are not something that is static. It's something that is very dynamic. And what this is about is that these rights, both in the courts and outside of the courts, in the context of assemblies, in the streets, are taken by, up by movements and brought into a political process, sometimes a process that is only political, sometimes a process that is also legal and that they have to be called for. And Achille Mbembe also said something important. He said what we have to manage is that universal standards are linked to local practices. And in the case of human rights in the last 20 years, this is something that we have been able to realize in an incredible way that hasn't been reflected upon enough yet. The fact that different um, players from the Global South human rights movement have um, put the human rights discourse to their use. And uh, that harbors a great potential. There's also great potential in linking up these different struggles. These uh, struggles that, for instance, Rodrigo was talking about, privatization of water, privatization of other common goods. Uh, crucial uh, players here are, of course, transnational corporations and the way in which uh, global industry or economy is organized. But these are things that we have to work on in Argentina, in Chile, and in Germany. And my colleague Miriam Maas will also speak about that as part of the final panel, because if and when these struggles are fought together, you'll be able to engage in a dialogue, a dialogue that is necessary and that addresses the question of how coming from different backgrounds and starting points you can act jointly because it is clear that the privileges that we have is not something Okay, I'm, I'm just reading in the chat something, someone keeps knocking on the table. Sorry, that was me, speaker says. Um, so the fact that these privileges do exist, that there are various degrees of access to resources cannot be undone by just uh, declarations of intent. They can't just be eliminated by means of a dialogue. What is necessary is to look at reality, to embark on a joint struggle and these different starting positions also have to take up this issue. Uh, the dialogue has to take up the issue of privileges and a negotiation needs to take place. And uh, in fact, this discourse on human rights is something that could be expanded on from my point of view, because it is clear that there, it must include much more explicitly the issue of uh, colonialization, of um, ecology and human rights, because it's not just about nature, it's not just about, it, it's about a lot of people who would be very poorly off if climate change continues unhindered. And of course, you also have to look at it from a feminist angle. And the social question, of course, must not be forgotten and the topic of endemic inequality, which um, has been reinforced thanks to the pandemic. That's all I had. Thank you.
Thank you very much. I think actually it's fine if we do not talk to each other because I believe all three of us, Wolfgang, myself and Rodrigo, all um, talked about things in the same vein. So I'd like to ask Anita to share the questions that she may have in the chat. Hello, Anita. Yes, hello. Hello to Frankfurt and Chile and Berlin. First of all, thank you so much uh, for this very important input from the three of you. Now, given how late it is, I'll keep the details short, the questions short. There were more detailed questions directed at Rodrigo. They were asking uh, about this process related to uh, the Constitution in Chile, how the neoliberal system can possibly be replaced there. There was a question directed at Wolfgang also, uh, specifically about ECCHR, what the political process is like there. But maybe these are questions that you can answer um, directly later on. Another question that has kept coming up and that also as part of the panel is really to think about what all three of you have said and look at it together and to wonder what about the struggles of human rights activists, those who lead the legal struggle, those who lead the social movements and those who also view human rights as the human right to each other. It's all very dynamic, as Wolfgang also has said, how um, the different dimensions need to be linked. So maybe in your final statements, you could pick up on that. Thank you. So maybe Wolfgang first, and then Rodrigo, and then myself. So it's the opposite order of how we started. Right, uh, the struggles of the social movement, human rights, how can they be related or linked? What is the relationship? Well, that relationship is something that needs to be reassessed time and again. And that is also why it is so important that in the context of conferences like this one and beyond, we keep also returning to the basics. That is, first of all, this revolutionary process, as Thomas has called it, where is it supposed to take us? Where can it? take us without already uh, knowing the final result beforehand. It's not so much about a specific utopia, but what could such a utopia look like? So that's one thing that in an abstract way, in a general way, you reach an understanding as to that. And the second thing is that human rights work and legal human rights work also must necessarily be political and political uh, human rights work is must be based on a careful political analysis of the structures of dominance and how that relates to utopia and to what is pragmatic needs to be reassessed time and again sometimes we'll have more of a legal approach for instance when we're trying to achieve something uh, to make something happen in in the courts, sometimes will try to drive things from a social point of view. For instance, as regards the topic of um, colonial reparation um, in connection, for instance, with the case in Namibia. And thank you, Anita, for making it so clear. Much more could be said about that. And um, we have a website, ECCHR, where you can read up on more uh, details, but maybe uh, it would be also worthwhile for us to get together with the organizers and your team and see how certain specific questions can possibly be discussed down the line. I'm not sure how that would work from a practical point of view, but um, the fact that people take part in the chat, I think, may show that it's worthwhile to keep keep the discussion going also after, afterwards. Thank you. Rodrigo? Yes. Well, our situation, of course, is a very specific one. 
as part of this struggle for human rights. We're also talking about environmental human rights, and we have been speaking of those for a long time. Uh, so speaking of environmental or ecological human rights, what I'm talking about is the right to be able to live in an area that is free of decontamination, that has free soil, uh, uh, clean soil, clean air, clean water. And now, as for the struggle regarding this new constitution, on April 11, the um, members of the bodies that will draft the constitution will be elected. That's um, not, that's a political struggle. And this political struggle that is taking place currently, as part of the struggle, the topics will be addressed that apply to the drafting of a new constitution and the question surrounding water will be one central question. On the 18th of July 2010, the United Nations said that the right to drinking water and sanitary installation um, was to be respected. And in, in Chilean wa Chile, water has been privatized. People have been excluded. And the most blatant example of this globally was now or can now be seen in Chile. That's how you should not go about making available water. Water management is held exclusively by the private sector. And the European Union, and specifically certain French organizations, Japanese organizations, Suez, for example, um, are a case in point. In Chile, we pay the highest fees for drinking water. Aguandina is the biggest sewage or, or water supply system that also supplies um, Santiago, and they are part of Suez, of the Suez system. And you Europeans also. I know that a lot of avocado is eaten in Europe, and amongst other things, uh, these avocados come from Chile. It's a tropical fruit which is being harvested um, and farmed with a lot of complexity. They need in incredible amounts of water, and that water then is something that citizens, certain communities will have to do without. So in the European Union, great quantities of avocados are in imported. And at the same time, look at the ownership structures regarding uh, the supply systems. So uh, it is very clear that this is where the struggle has to be fought. Human rights have to be advanced in Chile. Of course, this is something that you can publicly announce. That's all nice and well. But at the same time, uh, here a great, or in Europe, uh, a great number of avocados are being imported, which need a lot of water. And the same organizations happen to own the water supply system. So it must be clear that ecological human rights in Latin America and in Chile have to be um, accorded greater importance ecological human rights in Chile. If you want to defend them in Chile, you run the risk of uh, seeing yourself murdered. There are enough examples of that. There was an activist in 2016 who was uh, killed because she um, took the side of the indigenous population, but also spoke about uh, water supply. So the efforts must be at a global level, the protests, this work. And we need to analyze and take a look at what all of this has to do with each other, how it's interconnected. A revolutionary process must lead to radical and factual change of conditions. And the conditions are so bad in Latin America that this struggle is really important. Thank you. OK, so let me immediately come to my closing remarks before Anne Jung and Thomas Gebauer take over. Let me refer back to the previous forum with Said, And he said about the Syrian revolution, he refuted the idea 
that this revolution was over. He said, as long as the revolutionaries are supporting their revolution in a resilient way, this process won't be over. But what happened is this revolution has been interrupted. And this is a fate that plagues the revolutionary process again and again. And now in this interplay of the permanent revolution and the interruption of the revolutionary process, the rights come in, both with a look ahead and a look back. Wolfgang told us that today we're taking it for granted, at least in the rights that we all assign to each other, that we all are equal and free vis-a-vis -vis the law and have the right to determine ourselves. And we have these rights because there were the French and the American and the Haitian revolutions which declared this as a right in public. Then the American, the French and the Haitian revolutions were interrupted. We know this, but then came the October Revolution, which was uh, interrupted by the invasion of the white Russian army and by the and by Stalinism. And today we have the social and economic rights, which we wouldn't have had without the October Revolution. We have them because the October Revolution was there and because it had its impact despite this interruption. It has been maintained in these economic and social and collective rights. And Rodrigo pointed out in it again how central the struggle for water is in uh, Chile. The right to water is one of the central human rights we can now make reference to because there was this anti-colonial revolution, which in turn has been interrupted again and again. But during the interruption, the codified right still speaks. And here it's very important what Rodrigo said. The Chilean mass movements of the last two or three years weren't spontaneous, but they linked back to the processes which in the 1970s led to the election of Allende. And it's no accident, but they're now focusing on the installation of the right to water after the interruption. And I think this is a dynamism, this is the dialectic which makes revolution a permanent process and in which it can relate back again and again to the concrete utopian ideas codified in the human rights. And this is the end of my remarks, and let's now immediately move on to Anne, who will introduce Thomas to us.